got Jack and Christopher and Peter Clossy on the same panel. I mean, what, what does Kelly always say? Boom. <laughs> the last panel of our sixth annual Clean Tech and Technology Metal Summit. And uh, if you ask me, ask me, what is the next big thing? I'm going to tell you cobalt, okay? So while I love, don't get, don't get upset with me, Greg, I love rare earths, and Ian, I love rare earths, but uh, and I love lithium and graphite, but I think we have a bull run here. So let's start with Peter Clossy because we've been branding you as the Cobalt King. Cobalt King, go first, please. Thanks, Therese. Uh, I was speaking on this yesterday. The reason why Cobalt is likely the next big thing is simple economics. Increased demand, falling supply, rising prices. Cobalt, is, there's about a 50,000 ton consumption a year in the industrial area, uh, super alloys, paints, pigments, medicine, uh, nuclear. The demand is being driven by the cathode of the electric ba uh, batteries for electric vehicles, for your laptop, for the tools you use in your backyard, for your electric toothbrush. They all need cobalt, demand is skyrocketing. And Jack, yeah. weren't you supposed to talk today? What? Weren't you gonna talk about recycling? Well, uh, actually, you know, it, yes, it's, it's about cobalt at the moment. Um, interesting thing is that North America has about the same percentage use of cobalt as it does of rare. It's about 10% of the world supply. And we already recycled, of the, eight, of the 10,000 tons of cobalt used in the U.S. each year, 2,000 tons are recycled. It's, it, the, the alloy people really recycle it because they can't get they can't be sure of a supply of new cobalt. So when you refine cobalt ores, the refining is not very efficient. Uh, in the world, there's about 150,000 tons a year of, of cobalt, as cobalt in ore brought up, and maybe 120,000 tons of cobalt in the market because a lot of it's just left behind. First of all, it's not, it's not the primary product in the mining. That's nickel and copper normally, silver. So there, there's, a, there, there's a whole lot of cobalt lying around that's ready to be brought back into the market by, well, recycling's already underway. But Do you include waste rock and surface rock in recycling? Absolutely. But I'm not, that's, I don't want to call it recycling. Let's say that it's looking for value in residues, tailings, and scrap. And, and I have a friend who's a in the cobalt market uh, a trader, and he, and he sent me an email this morning, he said, do you want the floor sweeps? Yeah, yeah, I do, okay. And so this is a market that's about to take off, and even uh, the, the, let's say, the reclamation and recycling of low grades of cobalt. Think about something. If any of you still has a gold object on you, a tooth or a pin or something, you realize that some of the gold in that probably was used by Cleopatra to buy, you know, sparkling water or something, whatever she did. And we never throw gold away, do we? Never. It, it's, it's been a human, uh, it's just the way we think. Nobody's ever thrown any gold away. They might bury it with the pharaoh for a while, but it comes back up. We out. trust that gold is going to be worth something. Okay. Christopher, is this what you meant with downstream being the next big thing? The recycling of cobalt, for instance? Is this what you were talking about? The processing in North America of, say, recycling facilities? Is this part of what the big picture you had? Um, not really, because um, the, you actually can avoid the mine altogether. Um, because effectively it's cobalt that's come out of the ground and um, it doesn't need a miner to recycle it. Um, what we have is, you, what you would be mining is uh, you, the drawers and cupboards and closets around your house. If we take a good example, um, my house, uh, I have a wife and two children, and in our house there are probably around 15 redundant cell phones. They're not used anymore. We, we keep them for some emotional reason. Um, there are also several laptops that have died. There, there are batteries sitting around the house. Now, all of those batteries are then replicated in everybody's house. I'm sure everybody here has multiple 
are cell phone batteries that are dead sitting around the house. Now, if you were to take all those and then you were to recycle all of those, and of course, as um, in yesterday's discussion, throw the graphite away, but take the lithium out, take the graphite out, and then you, if you want to fiddle around, take the copper and the manganese out as well. Um, you could actually then have an amount of cobalt that is six times the current need for batteries for new cell phones. So you can actually deal with all that cell phone. Okay, demand. that's 60 seconds. Clausy? How do you encourage people to do that? We were talking earlier about the brown bag process. It took 20 years. Even now with your green bin, a lot of people don't do it. They just throw the garbage away. How do we change our society to do that? No one was paying you for the brown bag. Who's paying me for my battery? Okay. Do you want to pay someone for the battery? And then people will be rummaging around, where's that cell phone I saw last year? Well, it sounds to me like you have a business model here. We should talk later, Christopher. <laughs> Okay, so let's go back to the mining of cobalt. And we have Mark here. I mean, Mark, your company is taking off with your graphene uh, processing. Mm. You've got cobalt too. Can you yeah. just give us a bit of an overview? Yeah, sorry. Um, we do we have that. It wasn't trendy. We picked it up like five or six years ago. We've been nurturing it, waiting for the price to get good on, on some of the, compared to some of the grades. Um, I think one of the things, talking about waste stockpiles and stuff to remember is a lot of cobalt metallurgy is not that uh, it can be simple, but it often isn't. Of course, the word cobalt comes from the German word for goblin because it was very difficult to, to separate back Can you say that slower? I didn't get that. What is oh, it sorry. <laughs> cobalt, uh, cobalt originally is a uh, goblin uh, in um, the Saxon. So around Freiburg in the late 1700s when they managed to isolate it because cobalt is often in a sulphide form uh, that is, uh, um, well, the primary deposits are, are sulphides and it's hard to separate. So how much do you have? I mean, this is exciting. It's kind of like finding out, we have gold bikes back here, and you may not know, for instance, that alkane, in addition to being, you know, zirconium and hafnium and rare earths, they also do about 100 million in revenue of gold a year, okay? Those are the little surprises. Now we're finding out, Mark, you've got this cobalt. How much do you have? Uh, well, we've got a, a deposit that's currently got 105 drill holes in it over about a kilometer long, and a whole bunch of new things that are popping up all over the joint. His agreement last month, what, moved your stock up 66%. Okay, so Monty here is representing eCobalt, which is one of the big performers of the year and is a cobalt producer. That's you right. Or we will be. We're not close. a producer yet. Um, we are we? Uh, we expect to be in production by uh, mid-2019, uh, so we're only two years out. We're just finishing our feasibility study. We expect it fairly soon. And uh, once we get that, then we'll recommence construction and then it'll be very quick. You know, we've already got all our ground works done, so we just need to get the uh, money together to get underground. So we do expect to be in production by mid-2019. Okay, and what about you, Peter? You wanna give us a bit of an overview of CBLT? Can, can I pick up on what Jack was saying Absolutely. first? Absolutely, in fact, I, I recommend, we have a good group of power talkers on this panel. I recommend people just lean in. Just uh, keep your answer short, please. The cobalt embayment in Northern Ontario, is one of the richest cobalt slash silver deposits in the world. It was mined out in about 1908 to 1915, then it was remined in the 30s and remined in the 60s. The explorers went in, they pulled the ore off surface. There was one area called the silver sidewalk because it literally was a sidewalk of solid silver through the middle of town. The old right of way mine is right downtown cobalt before the fire. The mining methodologies in those days were very different from what we have today, and there was no value in the cobalt. So it was dumped. It's in the bush, it's in the lakes, it's in the rivers, it's under the roads. There have been a several turns of companies going into Northern Ontario, draining lakes, taking the silver, and redumping the cobalt. So there are estimates all over the map of how much cobalt is, quote, on surface. But if you're gonna include that in recycling, Chris, I'd be willing to bet there's more up there than there are in all of the closets and drawers uh, with the batteries. Uh, you haven't seen Christopher's home. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, isn't this, what, Chris, Christopher, isn't this what you meant by upcycling, a, a more comprehensive? Yeah. No? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so in the old days, they used to mine everything, right? Yeah. There's nothing left under surface. Everything came up and was dumped at surface, right, whereas right. now we leave them in the tunnels. He says, in the old days, and looks at Jack. <laughs> You should push no, back. Well, actually, it's even before my time. Imagine how long ago that is. And you're right. I mean, there's cobalt everywhere, and pe people are looking like this. Where is it? Well, they're, they're standing on it. 
Okay, but it's technology. That's the thing. I think uh, Chris was saying this earlier today. I, I, I would frankly just rather open the drawer and take it out of the drawer than actually have to lift a couple of roads in Northern Ontario <laughs> to get it. Yeah, but I can pull millions of pounds out of the roads. How much do you have in your drawer? Well, we need to mobilise the capital to do that. A much smaller amount of capital is used to get the batteries and then dissolve them and take the constituent parts out. That's the easy pickings. Because what I'm saying here is not that we've got a solution to the cobalt crisis. What we have is a source of cobalt to deal with all the laptop batteries and all the cell phone batteries that you're going to need for the next 10, 15 years. Because once you set up uh, the, the recycling process, when you've got a, a global population of 7 billion people with 7 billion cell phones, at that point, all those cell phones after two years, and most people only have a two year contract on their phone, will recycle it and you won't need to mine any more cobalt for that sector. Now, as for the electronic vehicles, electric vehicles, that's a totally different equation. And we have that's to ask you about Musk. Growing. Elon Musk, and that's your favourite topic. Who does he have a deal with for all his cobalt? Can someone bring me up to speed? Who, who's uh, Musk making a deal they're with? They're buying the cobalt? batteries from Panasonic. Okay. So where are they getting their cobalt? Through Panasonic? Is that correct? Okay. Well they're, well, they're buying the batteries, so it's whoever Panasonic is sourcing from. Well, they claim, of course, to want to be encouraging sustainability in North American sources. How yeah. can they do that? If I, I made a New Year's resolution to be nicer and not interrupt people. Look how that's going. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I don't think it's any secret to say most of us have met Tesla and various battery manufacturers, so I don't think I'm talking out of school, but uh, last time I caught up with Tesla when David Deke was still there, no interest in cobalt whatsoever. To, 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 yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't fussed. They just need it, but they have no interest in it. Yeah. Well, Actually, it wasn't, it wasn't they, they have put out reports that they don't need it. Have you seen that? And they've also... Uh, uh, discounted the issue of supply and demand. Christopher, I am absolutely certain that we communicated that with Jack in an email. Do you recall? Yeah, and the ostrich buries its head in the sand. Okay, all right. Yeah, the, the, in, in its SEC filings, Tesla has said that it has secured a supply chain for all of its critical metals, including, and it goes on to list many metals, including cobalt, and goes on to say that that supply chain has been sourced domestically. <laughs> I bet Monty has an opinion. Monty, tell us what you know, because I suspect you know more. Yeah, look at his eyes no, twinkling. There's no way that they can uh, source it domestically, because there is no domestic source, period, right now. Um, the only other source is really 98% of it is uh, byproduct. 60% comes out of the Congo. Um, the only primary deposit is in Morocco, and that's only 2%. So. Uh, they're going to have a hard time. All the cathode makers, there's not a single cathode maker in North America that I'm aware of. Um, all of the cathode makers are in Asia right now, mostly in China. Panasonic purchases their cathode, you know, also from other people. So they're, they're purchasing from a middleman to be able to build the batteries. Then they send the batteries to Tesla to build their battery packs. So it's a, it's a long chain, you know, so it's... Uh, It'll be interesting to see what they do, but it's not going to be, they're not going to be able to uh, secure a supply domestically. It just simply it doesn't exist. Okay, so do we have a bull market right now starting, or is it just beginning? I, I feel, from my perspective, that the education is just warming up out there. Peter, what do you think about this? I think the general populace hasn't yet caught on to the shortage of cobalt. The average investor and person in this room is aware of it but perhaps isn't as profoundly aware as those of us in cobalt are. Uh, if the cobalt market were a year long, we're probably in the third week of January. Okay, that's a great metaphor. And Christopher? Um, well, if the batteries that were put in the vehicles were called cobalt iron batteries, people would be worried about the cobalt. Um, it's all in the name. Okay, and I want to ask Mark, because Mark, you've just, you've got, you're working with multi-billion dollar companies. Now you must be privy to some confidential information that you might want to share with friends. <laughs> Mark, tell, tell us one thing we're not supposed to know. Well, that's, uh, well, look, I'll tell you a slightly different opinion. I obviously can't talk about some of those things, uh, the serious things. But I also think a lot of this price is um, we would have seen what Parler or the ex, some of the ex-Parler guys are doing. What, what I saw happen, I think, about 12 months ago with the, lithium, with the lithium price boom coming back again was a load of funds around the world, a lot of institutions that want to play the battery market. And graphite pricing drives them crazy. It's totally opaque and they don't really like any of that. Everyone wants to know what's the price, what's the market. And of the main battery minerals, you know, cobalt 
is LME listed, you've got a price history, it's much more transparent, as these things are. I know it's not really transparent, but it doesn't matter if you're an analyst and you're just trying to get some numbers down on paper to prove, you know, to support the paperwork. So I think what we've seen is a really, um, dare I say it, an analyst or um, almost a, a marketing type uh, drive that's hit it and the guys said, great, we're gonna rush all these contracts on the LME and that smashed the price up. But where is the other price? Uh, I mean, I'd love to know where other people use non-LME prices. Where do, where do you get your non-LME pricing from? Uh, as, far, as far as I know, no, and the oxides trade somewhere between 15 to 30 percent above LME. All right, so everyone's basing their price projections and working on stuff all based around an LME price that can be so easily stacked. Essentially, it's gone from, what, 15 to 55,000 in 12 months on a, on a volume of contract which doesn't right. really reflect anything in the real market. I, I forget by ton, Mark, but uh, by the pound, it was $9.85 in February of 16, mm. and as of Friday, it was $24.50 a pound. So, Jack, you speak with, uh, you know, uh, high-level politicians all oh, the right. time. I want to know about the Department of Defense and their interest in cobalt. Uh, I'll put you on the spot. It's a big secret, I uh, guess, because I don't think less, uh, any more than about 7 billion people know this, but... Um, <laughs> The, department, the, the U.S. Defense Logistics Agency, which is the stockpile, uh, has received uh, notice that it will be purchasing cobalt for the U.S. Uh, uh, stockpile as of uh, the beginning of their fiscal year, which is October 1st. Now, this may not sound like much to you, but they haven't been doing this. So the first thing they did, <laughs> they said, well, where do we do that? Okay, they're now in that phase of where do we get this stuff? I don't know how much they're supposed to buy, but they, they're, they're in the market right now and they're looking at, among other things, recycling. So, Monty, you know about how much cobalt there is out there. Is, is cobalt like some of the metals where, you know, you just have to find where a meteorite has hit the planet? And no, you get, it's and you get lucky. Where, where do we find, how much cobalt is there? Uh, well, there's actually a lot of it out there, but most of it's a byproduct of um, copper and nickel. So, you know, it's, a, it's not one of those things that you can just ramp up your production. You know, if you've got a copper mine and you ramp up your production to try and push the cobalt because the cobalt's doing well, you're going to end up driving down your copper price. So if that's your primary asset, then that's not going to work very well for you. Although I do know that uh, for companies like Glencore, cobalt has made a, a much more significant impact on their bottom line with the move that cobalt's made. So it'll be fairly interesting. There's obviously going to be a lot more people in the space, a lot more people looking. Um, but I think cobalt's got a long way to go to the upside. You know, if you consider that the average car right now has less than $1,000 worth of cobalt in it, um, if cobalt was to double the $50, which it went to in about uh, 2009, I believe it was, 2008, um, you, the price of the car would only increase by a thousand bucks. And when you look at the price of a cell phone, the small amount that's in it, it's just not going to have an impact. So cobalt does have a long way to move. We have one analyst in Johannesburg. She has one dog. Her dog is named Cobalt. And when I went to New York about two months ago, many of you here know Mark Christoph from Traxxas, and I asked him what his favorite technology metal was, and he said Cobalt. Now, Jack, does this surprise you? No, you, you know a Tesla battery has 16 kilo of cobalt. Yeah, so that works out to about 35 pounds, right? Yeah. So at uh, uh, Gentlemen, we can't hear you. Could you lean back in there? Because I think people would be interested in how yeah. much cobalt yeah. is in a so Tesla. It's a thousand dollars. It, about, yeah, about 15 or 16 uh, kilos. So that works out to about 35 pounds, a little more than that. At $25 cobalt, you're looking at between you know, $875, $900 yeah. worth of cobalt per. Yeah. Okay, so then take that math further. Tesla said they're making half a million Model 3s. <laughs> at 15 kilograms a car, that's 7.5 million kilograms of cobalt, yeah. or 8,400 tons, or 8% 8 of the current supply for one model of one car. Uh, please note, that would be as much as the entire manufacturing industry in North America uses all by itself. So they would double the usage of cobalt in the United States. Even Chris's house isn't that big. And just when my phone rang earlier, it was uh, Electrovea trying to get in on the panel <laughs> on, the, uh, on the battery materials. So Christopher, um, tell us a little bit more about uh, where you think cobalt is headed this year. I mean, people come to this conference to find out 
about things they don't understand. Is there any additional uh, something you can give us uh, for us new investors in Cobalt on how we should select a Cobalt stock? Because it, it looks like we have a bunch of new plays coming out, and it doesn't sound like any of them know what they're doing. Not all of them. Oh, oh, oh. No. But, okay. but well, I won't address the, 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 these companies, but what I will say is that um, uh, the Our, point that was made about investors getting in on it um, is a valid one. I used to be a hedge fund manager myself once, a, once upon a time. And um, if you look at this, the, the issue that came up for a hedge fund manager sitting in his midtown Manhattan office last, mid last year, um, he, he wanted to get in on the battery scene. Uh, does he buy um, a thousand uh, tons of, of uh, lithium or does he buy um, the equivalent amount of cobalt? And if he bought the equivalent amount of cobalt for the same money value, he'd end up with a lot less to store. And storage is a big issue if you're going to start hoarding. And these hedge funds want to hoard. And so um, it was more sensible to buy the cobalt. Now, as Jack's just revealed, um, the, the strategic reserve or whatever it's called is suddenly woken up, the light bulb has come on, and they've decided now we've got a panic buy in the cobalt market. So you've got a, a variety of idiots um, with a lot of money um, running in and uh, pushing it up. And you know, this is a classic mining type thing where you get the spike, then the dump. Um, but there are people who, you know, professional people in the trading community who think actually that the spike may just um, you know, there, there'll be a certain amount of profit taken by the hedge funds, but it may not actually result in a slump because if I was the Chinese, I would, if hedge funds started selling, I would move in and I'd start buying because the Chinese do not have a cobalt source of, of substance of their own. They're desperate to buy um, anything that the DRC will, will sell them. Um, and the, so you've got the, one smart buyer and you've got a collection of dumb buyers um, and they're all going after the same thing which means higher prices. I heard you were suggesting that China actually does have a supply. It's called Congo, it's called the Philippines, it's called Indonesia. Um, I mean, they, they certainly are cap you know, have already been doing what the Japanese metal agency probably should have finished the job doing back in the 70s. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree on the, 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 the price outlook, as far as I'm concerned, is still part of a mega trend. Actually, the price in real terms is not stupid. Uh, compared no, to some, so so uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, and I think if you look at the products and how far away recycling is, um, uh, to some degree, although that's really accelerating, obviously through Jack's good work, but also just the sheer size of it that needs to be done for the EV market that's growing. So then that'll that'll offer the opportunity. Um, but yeah, I, I hear that cobalt that China within their bound, within their borders don't have a heck of a lot, no. which is a which is a good thing. Um, just to get back on the strategic uh, buy side, so in, in Europe, cobalt is on the critical minerals list, which so in the EU, that means that if you've got a project involving cobalt, you can get uh, preferred status on, on development. So there is, a, um, there is some upside to it on the speed you can bring projects to market if you're on that list and cobalt's one of them. Oh, I'm staring at you, Peter. All right. Go ahead. Um, Cobalt is different from the rare earths. We heard earlier that the magic in the rare earths is in the processing and in the end product that you create for a buyer that needs that product. Cobalt comes out of the ground. People need it in its raw form or in its oxide form. Cobalt is more like gold or nickel or copper than the rare earths. The demand is there. We don't have to go create it. We don't have to invent a product that, that's needed. That product is needed now. Okay, just I'm gonna warn, oh, Ian wants to follow up. I'm trying to remember what. So, yeah, my view is that what we see, saw on the rear earth, so if, if cobalt goes to $50 a pound, all those smart dudes in China and Japan are going to get out and say, we need to uh, take cobalt out of the battery system. We need to take it out. We'll go and find something else. Now, that takes a year or two, but what's to say that isn't going to happen and isn't going to happen very quickly? No, I said we saw it in rare earths. Why won't that happen with cobalt? It'll take a lot longer than a year or two. Just the development of it, to try and develop a new battery. Um, there's several people that are trying to work on it now. It's all in the laboratory, and it'll, it'll take a long, long time before it's developed. Before they can get it to be commercially into production, when you've got all these car companies that are already looking at the NMC and the NCA batteries that have cobalt in them, they're not going to just switch gears in an instant and move on to you know, something else in another year. So it'll be, uh, it'll be a long time before anything gets into commercial production that can compete with a cobalt battery. 
All right, uh, perhaps a bit of a naive question, but if, uh, if cobalt is on a return cycle back to $50 a, uh, a pound, uh, where it was at its peak, what was the mechanism that knocked it off of that $50 a pound um, point? And is, is whatever happened the last time um, a mechanism that's um, it's sitting there waiting to happen again? Now, what happened last time was there was a uh, civil war in the DRC. 60% of, uh, of cobalt comes out of the DRC. So when they went to war, it basically shut down the supply coming out of the Congo. The price shot up to 50 bucks. Then as soon as the, they resolved that um, and they got back to work in the mines there, then of course, you know, the uh, cobalt started to flood the market again and then it collapsed down to about $9. The difference this time around is that the push up in uh, the price of cobalt is demand driven as opposed to a problem with supply. But keep in mind that the Congo is a powder keg now. I mean, they're on the verge of a civil war as it is. They've got a problem with Ebola. I mean, every, you know, they have every problem that you can imagine, when it, not to mention the child labor and everything else. So it's a problem, and that's where 60% of the cobalt comes from. So at any day, we could have a big issue that could drive cobalt even higher. Um, hopefully that won't happen. I'd rather see it continue on a slow, gradual move up based on demand rather than a supply issue. So we just have two questions left. Uh, Dr. Flint, Troy Grant tells me you're the smartest person in the entire universe. So we expect a really good question. No pressure. Troy is misinformed. <laughs> There's lots of smarter people in the room. Um, the uh, Democratic, or sorry, the Undemocratic Republic of Congo is, looks like it's going to probably explode. I was wondering if you, anyone on the panel could give me a comment on what you think that would have on the impact of cobalt price and availability. I'll just do the ethical supply chain that Amnesty International has been agitating for, which is part of that political corruption process. Our call, which we made yesterday and we made publicly, is if the ethical supply chain is imposed, it will knock roughly 18% of the global supply of cobalt offline and prices will approach $100. Okay. My thoughts on that subject would be that uh, the Chinese will um, pay some local warlord to make sure that they get uh, whatever's going, as per usual. So, but between the question and your answer, let's assume you're right. But that then brings in further geopolitical intrigue. How will the United States respond? How will the UK respond? How will Russia respond? And just your answer adds itself to the conflict that's going on in there and the instability of the supply chain. Yeah, let's ask Wilbur Ross if he even knows what cobalt is. He'll get a blank look, I'm sure. Yeah. Andre Gauthier of Matamic would like to ask a question. Uh, if you uh, remind the, uh, when the uh, bubble of the river, okay, the, the, the price uh, increased uh, dramatically, and uh, I'm at that time I'm looking in the uh, at mini store, you, every, you, you don't miss any computer, any et cetera, et cetera. That, that's, that's for the river. For the cobalt, uh, if you have the, uh, most of the cobalt would be in the battery, the iron, okay? And if it's for the electric and the uh, hybrid car, et cetera, mostly electric, but you have the other, the, the other car. What is the impact, okay, if, if I remember, for a, a normal car, okay, it's, um, uh, it's 4,000 pieces or parts, Okay, and they are, the, the, the price of the parts is very important. The, 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 the price of the car for a certain segment of the market, that's very important. If, if we think that the, uh, the uh, uh, electric car um, uh, need less parts and et cetera, what is the margin that the, uh, that the uh, car manufacturer has if the cobalt go to 30 or $50 a pound? You had it earlier for the battery. I don't know how much cobalt's in the rest of the vehicle. There's probably a little bit in an alloy somewhere, but. Yeah, it would be about a thousand bucks per vehicle right now at $25 cobalt. So if you double the price of cobalt to $50, you're looking at an extra thousand dollars per car. Mm -hmm. So it's not really that much. And it's absolutely, it's very small for a cell phone, you know, computers, anything like that. Is there any in the alloys? There is. Yeah. yeah, there is, but there's not, I mean, it's a very small amount, and that's why I rounded it up, right? If you take $25, about 35 pounds, you get 875, and then maybe you've got a little bit more cobalt here and there throughout the vehicle, round that up to 1000 bucks. 
So, you know, double price of cobalt, you're looking at an extra grand, and that's about it for an electric car. So it's not that significant, really, if you're looking at a forty, fifty thousand dollar car. So on this note, I'd like to take it to Amanda and Paul, who just keep making more and more money and are looking for creative ideas. Cobalt. <laughs> I, 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 I just would, you know, say that seems to me to be a lot of money for a car. So with rare earths, where you're talking about it, maybe being four kilos. Right, and so therefore, you know, a, a, a heavy rare earths car, you might have been talking about increasing it during the crisis by 150 or $200. You know, that was enough to send automotive manufacturers into a tailspin and going to look for functional equivalents, right? And the reason why is because they can't afford, they can't, they don't have the option of changing the price point of the car during the car's life cycle. So if they launch it at 24,999, three years down the track on that model, they can't put the price up to 25,999. So I think this is a big problem. No, you're, you're right about that. It's not an insignificant amount, and I didn't mean to put it that way. But the other thing that's happening, too, is that the uh, range is getting to be bigger on the batteries. Batteries are getting to, more, to be more efficient, and at that point, they will be able to reduce the amount of cobalt to a certain degree. Like, if you look at an NMC, it's about 15% cobalt, and NCA, which Tesla uses, is about 9%. So, through efficiencies, over the next several years, they will be able to decrease the amount of cobalt that goes into those batteries to a certain amount. So if they can decrease the cobalt to a certain degree, then you're not going to get the full bump of $1,000. I'm talking about the cost of it today based on the batteries today. But the technology is improving. It's, it's true that, it's true that the, the, the key metric there might be the dollars per kilowatt hour rather than the looking at the vehicle as a unit. So, so if, it's, if it's a dollar per kilowatt hour, and you're also getting performance gains, then that, that can remediate basically some of that, that price increase. But at the end of the day, demand is still exceeding supply. Yeah, but there, is a, there, there are options. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's, there's, some politics, uh, there's some politics behind some of the chemistry used in the batteries as well that can drive some uh, manufacturing centres to, to go in different directions. And I agree that it's very hard to shift batteries overall, but there have already been investments made in this area that are, are sort of heading off. Um, but to get back to Ian's point about why won't it just crash again, I think because it is part of an overall mega trend where there's all these new demand drivers. So by hook or by crook, as the years go by, I think it's like lithium. Lithium crashed down again, right? But then it's up again and then it's down. But I think if you look back over 10 years, I think it's up in nine out of 10 years, but you only just noticed it recently. So, and I think cobalt will, will be the same that way. One other thing too, you know, something I haven't heard anyone mention at all in the last two days is uh, power walls, like the Tesla power wall. Chrysler in Germany are, also makes power walls the same, very similar actually. They're about the size of a refrigerator. But as that, uh, that market is waiting in the wings and will also take off. So, you know, you've got another massive market that's right in behind all of this is just getting ready to ramp up now. So as we see the power walls ramp up, I mean, that's, that's going to also cause an increase you know, in demand. And there's about seven kilograms of cobalt in a Tesla power wall. Okay, let's I finally have one question. Uh, I don't know much about lithium batteries because, as you know, there is no reuse inside, so those products are not interesting to me. But uh, this morning we heard that lithium demand was higher than supply or will be higher than supply. Now it's cobalt, sorry, I didn't, I missed most of the presentation, but cobalt as well. And I feel like uh, there is little brain spent on recycling batteries, which is amazing to me because batteries are easy to collect. And then it's just a matter of uh, brain work and uh, try to recycle as much as possible from those. The the problem expense. there, I'm a great advocate for the recycling, but if you look at the, the size of cell phones, how many cell phone batteries would you have to recycle to make, you could make the equivalent of the same amount of cell phones with those, if, with each battery. But how many each of those, if you take them out of circulation, do you need to make one Tesla battery? And we're, you're probably talking about hundreds. So it's a hundreds to one ratio. Yeah, that's good, but uh, I work on the lighting and recycling back in 2006. 
And the major difficulty was that the recycling was not organized. So if it had been organized 10 years earlier, you would have a code bar on each lamp telling you what kind of material it was so that you could adjust very easily the chemical process. Recycling has to be organized long in advance. I agree that today batteries go to phones more than to Tesla cars, but it will change over time, so you better organize the recycling now, not in 10 years' time. But recycling is a product of price. If the price had stayed at $9, we wouldn't be talking about recycling cobalt batteries. Um, and what would have happened is if you'd started recycling cobalt batteries 10 years ago, the price would have gone to $4. Um, because there would have been far too much cobalt around. Now you've got a situation of what was a, a relatively balanced market of supply and demand just being totally blown up by an extra tsunami of demand potentially coming along. The other problem too, the big expense with recycling, it's, uh, it's, it's not a problem getting the cobalt out of the cathode, but it, it's a problem getting the cathode out of the battery. That's where the big expense is with recycling batteries right now. It's been described to me as like trying to put the egg, take the omelet and putting it back inside the eggshell. Yeah, very difficult. And not all the mineral phases will go back into something you can use. Jack and I were talking about graphite. Um, after these batteries have got electrons go through them, the actual individual atoms can reposition themselves and their properties will change. So it, it doesn't mean you, it, once you've made it, it can come back again. So th there's a lot of work to be done, and a lot of these big OEMs are going to have to do it. I mean, once Ford and all the major manufacturers do bigger and bigger EVs, they probably can't even do them without having a recycling uh, program set up. Okay, I've got a naive really? question. Um, we currently recycle the, the Duracell batteries, right? Yeah. Like, are those actually economically efficient to recycle, or is that government do-gooding at work? I think it's, it's mostly marketing. I mean, the amounts I've seen, you guys might have seen something different, but I'm seeing about 5% max content. I, I happen to know the guy who does that. And he told me he sends back uh, alloy. Sorry, what does he do? Recycles. The, the so he owns the company that actually does the recycling? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So what he does, he sends the metal back to the battery maker, and they advertise uh, Re using green recycled materials. It's, it's a maximum of 2% of the new battery. But they, they don't mention that. They say this battery has been made from recycled materials. So this what, is, what are the efficiencies then? Okay. None. It, it's all for It's just token marketing. All right, and this is, this, this makes is, me misty eyed. This is why I love Investor Intel. We are a platform for debate and dialogue for intelligent investors to ask questions so that we can, we can understand what we're investing in. So on that note, we're gonna take this up into the wine and cheese reception. And I'd like to thank everybody for attending.